Good afternoon and welcome to the Heritage Foundation and to our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our Heritage.org website. I would ask everyone in-house if you'll be so kind to make that last check that cell phones have been turned off. It will be appreciated. And, of course, we will post the program on the Heritage homepage uh, following today's presentation for your future reference. And our Internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments mm -hmm. simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our guest today is Nick Loris, who serves as our Herbert and Joyce Morgan Fellow, as well as a senior policy analyst in the Thomas A. Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies. He is an economist. But he focuses on energy, environmental and regulatory issues, the economic effects of environmental policies and regulations, climate change, energy efficiency and subsidies, as well as uh, the benefits of free market environmentalism. Before joining us here, he was an associate at the Charles G. Koch Charitable Foundation, and he also serves as an editorial intern for townhall.com. Please join me in welcoming Nick Loris. Nick. Well, thank you, John, and thank you all for joining us today for what's going to be uh, an important and interesting discussion, not to mention uh, certainly a timely one. You know, it was just this past weekend you had folks dressing up uh, as polar bears marching down the streets of Manhattan claiming that we need urgent action on climate change. Uh, you had celebrities flying in on their private jets uh, telling us that we're the gluttonous energy users uh, and we need to stop that energy use uh, in order to stop the planet from cooking. And it was just yesterday that President Obama said, you know, that the alarm bells are ringing on climate change and that no one's going to get a pass. Uh, and, and for those of you who, who follow the debate, and I feel many of in this room, you know, this isn't a fi five alarm fire we're, we're dealing with when it comes to climate change. Uh, in fact, there's not really a, a cause for alarm at all. Uh, you know, we hear these proclamations about more Sandys and more Katrinas, uh, more polar vortexes, all of these things associated with man-made greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and that's just not borne out in, in the data, uh, not just from our own government, but from things that uh, Al Gore and the like hail as the, the magnum opus of climate change, you know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I mean, you can look at their studies, uh, and, and they conclude that there's no frequent trend in uh, more frequent and intense natural disasters or, or extreme weather events. There's, there's no data uh, that supports the trends in, in things like floods, droughts, uh, hurricanes, or tornadoes. Um, more importantly, the, the fact is, you know, we haven't actually experienced any warming in more than a decade and a half. And this is something in, in which the climate models in which our government relies upon uh, to, to implement these greenhouse gas regulations that will certainly drive up the cost of energy for American families and businesses rely upon, you know, they're predicting warming when, in, in fact, no warming has actually occurred. And, and that's one of the several serious problems uh, with basing policy that's going to drive up costs for American families and businesses uh, on such models. And, and the fact that these models try and project costs and, and temperature changes out to the year 2300, uh, and they can't even get the past uh, decade and a half right, you know, we shouldn't really be basing economy collapsing regulations upon these models. Uh, yet the administration is forging ahead. They're acting like this is, you know, their key issue. Uh, and I'm excited to have our speaker here today because, you know, what, what he shows us and, and what he discusses in his book is really nothing new. Um, you know, when, when it comes to the debate of our changing climate and these proclamations of, of doomsday scenarios, uh, when it comes to climate change, it, it's not, not all too new. Um, and that's why uh, I'm excited to have our guest speaker here today, uh, Rupert Darwall, because he, he takes a really unique perspective on this issue. Um, he, he gives a historical perspective uh, of the origins and the growth of the warming movement, and a very interesting account of the different players in the movement, their line of thinking in, in terms of the science uh, and the scientific process, you know, when they decided to really throw the scientific process out the window and disregard it, uh, and importantly, the, the, the political process involved with this as well. You know, I think this is really kind of a one-of-a-kind book that treats uh, global warming uh, and, and its policy implications, you know, as a history lesson, uh, and it, and the ideas that formed it, uh, the people that created the ideas, and this intersection of politics, economics, science, and international diplomacy. Uh, so, with that said, I'll I'll introduce our featured speaker, Rupert Darwall. Uh, 
Mr. Darwell studied economics and history at Cambridge University, after which he worked at the Conservative Research Department and then in the city as an investment analyst and, a, and in corporate finance. He served as one, one of three special advisors to the Chancellor of the, of the Exchequer, one of the others being David Cameron, and he's written extensively for publications on both sides of the Atlantic, including a cover story for The Spectator, The Telegraph, Wall Street Journal, National Review, and Policy Review. He's attached to two London-based think tanks where he's completed work on welfare reform and civil service reform, reform. and he has a major new study coming out on renewables and energy policy next month, uh, so we'll be looking forward to that. Um, so with that said, please uh, join me in welcoming our fe featured speaker, Rupert Darwall. I'm enormously grateful to the Heritage Foundation uh, for the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon and to Niall Gardner and to Nick for uh, arranging this event at uh, short notice. I'm also very pleased to see Harlan Watson, who was one of uh, my most treasured uh, sources uh, for the book, and also gives me the opportunity to say thank you to Ed Meese for giving me the benefit of his, his insights into one of the hinges of that history, which I will touch on later. What I'd first like to do is talk about where the ideas that form global warming came from. Then I'd like to spend a little time talking about 1988, the year when the age of global warming really started, as the two key figures in that narrative are greatly admired by everyone here, uh, Ronald Reagan and, and Mar Margaret Thatcher. With yesterday's UN Climate Change Summit in New York, I'd then like to say a few words about the international context and explain why the history shows that a comprehensive global treaty was always out of reach from the very start. And finally, I'd like to say a few words on what I believe this issue is all about, the bottom line, if you like. History tells us much about the human condition, in particular, its follies. It's ideas that make history, Ludwig von Mises wrote, human society is an issue of the mind. In his masterly book, Sleepwalkers, on the causes of the First World War, historian Christopher Clarke wrote of the shifts in mentality which are more fundamental, more difficult to measure than, than what is observed in public opinion and the press. And the study of the past helps us understand the mentality, the governing ideas of the age in which we live and of an age that is passing, as I believe to be the case with global warming. From studying the past, we learn that history is fluid. Events are contingent. Seemingly immutable categories that condition thought and action change and evolve over time. As the British philosopher and mathematician A. N. Whitehead uh, put it, the spiritual precedes the material. It builds cathedrals before the workmen have moved a stone. A history of the ideas that formed the global warming cathedral is, I suggest, doubly necessary because scientists dominate the discourse. For them, history is not so much a closed book as irrelevant to the problems of the future. But just because scientists have a cultural aversion to learning from the past doesn't mean that we should. So I'd like to reframe the issue of the science in terms of how was it that what was, for little more, what, what was little more than a scientific curiosity for much of the 20th century came to define an age? As climate scientists like to remind us, the basic physics were established in the 19th century. A few months before Charles Darwin published The Origin of the Species, John Tyndall had demonstrated the radiative properties of carbon dioxide. In 1896, the Swedish chemist Svante Arrhenius wrote his famous paper estimating the effect of industrialization on atmospheric temperature, and the climate seemed to respond. After a partial decline in the first decade of the 20th century, temperatures rose. In the 1920s, the Arctic appeared to be warming up. So little ice had never, never before been noted in newspaper reporting in 1922. The Dust Bowl of the 1930s was the most extreme climatic event in American history. And in 1938, Guy Stewart Callender, a brilliant uh, English all-rounder, quantified the effect of a 10% increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide on global temperature. All the scientific and geophysical uh, preconditions were there for global warming, but the elements which turned out to be decisive were not. So my point here is science alone cannot explain how global warming became a political phenom phenomenon. The explanation must be found elsewhere. 
Global warming is the confluence of ideas into one big idea. Scratch it, and you'll invariably find con concern about there being too many people in the world. Alarm about population growth was popularised by Thomas Malthus at the beginning of the 19th century, a century in which Britain's population nearly quadrupled, cash wages uh, for factory workers rose by 50%, the purchasing power of money doubled, and, the life, expe and life expectancy began its long-term increase. But despite the complete failure of Malthus's predictions that population growth would be repeatedly checked by famine and disease and war, those three uh, uh, devils of uh, brides on horseback that we hear, heard a lot of uh, yesterday at the uh, United Nations, for true believers, the idea that there, there are or will be too many humans is an article of faith. In 1865, the brilliant economist William Stanley Jevons m modified, modified uh, the Malthusian co construct. Resource depletion in the form of exhaustion of cheap coal meant the prosperity of Victorian Britain could not last. Jevons made the mistake that every one of his depletionist successors makes. He hadn't factored in the impact of new technologies and new discoveries. Jevons had convinced himself that the steam engine was the farthest mankind could go. Electrical power, he wrote, was a delusion and petroleum was merely the liquid essence of coal and an expensive one at that. John Maynard Keynes wrote that Keynes's conclusions were influenced by what he called a psychological trait which many shared, which was unusually strongly developed in Jevons, of a certain hoarding instinct and readiness to be alarmed by the idea of exhaustion of resources. In the main, though, governments tended to subscribe to concerns about resources running out. Jevons had a meeting with Gladstone, who told him his book was masterly, though fortunately Gladstone did little about it. The first major politi politician to promote resource pessimism was Teddy Roosevelt. The idea still obtained, he wrote in his autobiography, that our natural resources were inexhaustible. In May 1908, he held a three-day conference at the White House, which led to the calling of a National American uh, con conservation conference, and if his term had not expired, the first global conference on the environment would have taken place at The Hague in 1909 and not in Stockholm 63 years later. But not all governments. The absolute standout exception to the tendency to be scared of resource resources running out was President Truman's Materials Policy Committee appointed in 1951. Chaired by C CBS President William S. Paley, the committee produced its report, Res Resources for Freedom, and I believe there's a think tank not far from here, uh, Resources for the Future, which Paley uh, founded, um, produced its report in 1952. The, the report could have easily fallen for resource pessimism. It didn't. In fact, there is no more comprehensive, more intelligent, and more confident statement made by any official report in any country, in any era, on this subject than resources for freedom. It was a popular fallacy, the report said, to regard our resource base as a fixed inventory, which, when used up, will leave society with no means of survival. American history showed why. In developing America, our forebears consumed resources extravagantly but we are certainly better off in materials than they were. To hold resources for the future involved a sacrifice that may never be recouped. It would, the committee said, be like the early settlers in New, New England conserving babies for a generation that gets its light from kilowatts. So their solution. Economic growth was good. American capitalism, technology and free trade were the answers to potential resource constraints 1952 was a challenging year. A former ally had turned into adversary. The, cold, the Iron Curtain had come down. The Soviet Union was developing an H-bomb. China had been lost, and the Korean War was not going well. Yet far from turning inward, what shines through the report is, is its sheer confidence in America and in its, its defining feature, the belief in a better future. Contrast resources for freedom's openness to the, world, to the world today and the time it's taken the current administration not to approve Keystone XL and all the hand-wringing in whether to allow fossil fuel exports. The sudden emergence of environmentalism as, as a political movement in the post-war world can be dated with precision, just 10 years after Resources for Freedom with publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in 1962. The political impact of environmentalism uh, following its impact, following its, uh, its publication, was immense. Uh, 
I would go so far as to say that Silent Spring is the most consequential book of the post-war era. As Al Gore remarked, before Silent Spring, the environment was not even an entry in the vocabulary of public policy. It marked the beginning of the first environmental wave, which rose with astonishing speed, rolling through the 1960s and cresting 10 years later with the first UN conference on the environment at Stockholm. However, environmentalism's, environmentalism's success in the international reader needed somebody else. That person was Barbara Ward. Barely remembered today, it is hard to overstate her influence. British born in her mid 20s, as an editor on The Economist, her network on this side of the Atlantic uh, was even deeper and more extensive than in Britain, but it extended to the Vatican and to leaders of post colonial Africa and, and India. If I give you three names, you can get a flavour of her politics. She wrote Adlai Stevenson's last speech. Lyndon Johnson once said that hers were the only books he read, writing to her two days before he left the White House, whatever mark we have made in these last five years clearly bears your stamp too. Robert McNamara said that Ward was one of only three people he would take a telephone call from before 10 in the morning, the other two being his wife and Catherine Graham. Ward believed in planning. It was imperative for mankind to know where it's going and what the world will look like in 20 years' time, Ward wrote in a, in a 1966 paper, Spaceship Earth. Quote, it is surely inconceivable that we should turn the whole human experiment over to forces of change which we can neither master nor even fully understand. Ward's achievement was to formulate a synthesis of first world environmentalism and the third world development agenda. Its, its essence is that economic growth is double-edged. In the case of rich countries, growth harms the environment. In the case of developing nations, growth improves the environment. Ward fleshed out this formula, which today the world knows as sustainable development. In the 1970s and 1980s, this agenda was crystallised in the new international economic order as part of the third world's demand for massive resource transfer, transfers from the West. In, the period, the, the doc, in this period, the doctrine of sustainable development worked its way onto the in, international agenda through the 1980 North-South Brandt Report and finally with the 1987 Brimpton Report. Global warming's catalyzing idea is the preeminent role of scientists, that science should be mobilized to save the planet, science as global therapeutics. And the science and the planning clearly go hand in hand, and scientists are great believers in planning. And it was pithily expressed by the first political leader of undoubted world stature to embrace global warming. Quote, the problem science has created, science can in fact solve. Which brings us to 1988, the annus mirabilis of global warming, the year of NASA scientist James Hansen's Senate testimony, the establishment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and if you hadn't already guessed the world leader I just uh, uh, referred to, Margaret Thatcher's speech to the Royal Society. Environmental policy is possibly the one subject on which Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher did not see eye to eye. Even the one big environmental issue on which they did agree on, the threat of ozone depletion, they did so for very different reasons. Hers were environmental, Ronald Reagan's on concerns for the health and economic well-being of Americans. In her last two years in office, Mrs. Thatcher consistently championed the issue of global warming, although her initial solution, much influenced by the financier Jimmy Goldsmith, was to plant more trees, she ended up firmly on the side of the Europeans in advocating emissions cuts. I cover this extensively in the book, particularly in the Green Warrior and Rush to Judgment chapters. With Mrs. Thatcher's backing, it's explicable that the Toronto uh, 1988 G7 summit uh, formally endorsed the Brundtland Report's concept of sustainable development and its call for environmental considerations to be integrated into all areas of economic policymaking. The summit also declared that global climate change, along with other environmental threats, required, and I quote, I quote, priority attention. But why did Ronald Reagan, attending his last G7, endorse sustainable development, a, 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 concept, a, a concept which is really a form of globalised Scandinavian social democracy? Researching the book, I asked former Secretary of State George Shultz. He replied that he had no specific recollection of discussions on the Brinton Report and sustainable development. And I suspect the reason that the Reagan administration uh, 
The reason for this was that the Reagan administration was focused on much larger issues. The Soviet Union's decision to withdraw from Afghanistan and managing the end of the Cold War. However, there is very little evidence to suggest that President Reagan had changed his views in his last year as president. That year, Brian Mulroney had pressed him to agree a treaty on acid rain. Reagan said no. But I strongly disagree with Patrick Allitt in his otherwise superb book on America in the Age of Environmentalism, which described Reagan as an anti-environmentalist. As governor of California, Reagan acted as a conservationist in the mold of Teddy Kennedy. He created the 58,000-acre Redwood National Park. He stopped uh, the Ross D uh, Dos Rios uh, Dam, what Lou Cannon calls his finest environmental achievement, and he campaigned against the Trans-Sierra Highway. But Reagan rejected Roosevelt's resource pessimism. He was the leading crit critic of Jimmy Carter's energy policies. He didn't believe a CIA report claiming that oil would run out in 30 years' time, which, which would mean if the CIA had been right, we'd already be into the second decade of a world with no oil. And he argued that Carter's energy conservation measures were pointless if all it meant that th was that the oil ran out three, uh, three years sooner. President Reagan's last year in the White House overlapped with the first year of the age of global warming. Four years later, his success as White House was split down the middle on whether President Bush should go to the Rio Earth Summit. So I asked Ed Meese what Reagan would have done. His answer was clear. Reagan would have gone to Rio to explain why he wouldn't sign the UN Climate Change Convention. I think conservatives today have much to learn from Ronald Reagan's handling of environment and energy issues. Rio and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change bring, brings us to our third topic, the international context. The rise of environmentalism in the 1960s coincided, in fact, slightly post-dates, the rise of another force in the post-war world, the goal of the third world to industrialise. Ever since that first UN Environment Conference in Stockholm in 1972, developing nations' participation in global environmental talks was conditional on any agreement not fettering their development goals. That conditionality is built into the architecture of the 1992 UN Framework Convention. It created a bifurcated regime, Annex 1, which is for the developed nations, and the rest, uh, and the, rest the division running along the so-called Brandt Line, which you can see on the cover of the Brandt Report, dividing the prosperous north from the permanently immiserized south. At the Climate Change's first Conference of the Parties in Berlin in 1995, Angela Merkel, then German, German Environment Minister, brokered the Berlin Mandate. Non-Annex One nations only agreed to let negotiations proceed if they were held absolutely immune from the prospect of legal obligation to limit their greenhouse gas emissions. Agreeing the Berlin Mandate was a critical error uh, by the Clinton administration, if you like, the original sin of the climate change negotiations, with the, which the administration of George W. Bush and, and Harlan laboured mightily to overcome and, 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 and achieved a great deal at Bali in 2007, despite the efforts of, uh, of Al Gore. The exclusion of China, India and other major emerging economies is why the Kyoto Protocol would have been dead on arrival in the US Senate and why President Clinton did not, did not send it to the Senate. The Climate Change Convention has no graduation mechanism to Annex 1. Since 1992, only two countries have joined Annex 1, two economic powerhouses, not China and India, but Malta and Cyprus, and that's only because they joined the EU. In the book, I trace the various attempts in the climate change negotiations for inclusion of a graduation mechanism and for non-Annex 1 parties to acquire Annex 1-like obligations. All were circumvented and ultimately defeated. And to make a rhetorical point, was this the result of machinations of malign fossil fuel interests or of sceptics and deniers, as the climate marchers in New York would have us believe? The West's misunderstanding of the contingent nature of developing nations' involvement in the climate change talks explains why there was no treaty at Copenhagen in 2009 and why the Obama administration has given up uh, hope of agreeing one in Paris next year. So, so lastly, to the big question, what is this all about? What's the bottom line? 
Speaking at the 2007 Bali Climate Conference, Al Gore told climate delegates that they should feel privileged, quote, to be alive at a moment when a relatively small group of people could control the destiny of all generations to come. Global warming involves the oldest question in politics, who governs? An open society, philosopher Karl Popper wrote, is one that not merely tolerates dissenting opinion, but respects them. Democracy, that is a form of government devoted to the protection of the open society, cannot flourish if science becomes the exclusive possession of a closed set of specialists. Because climate science became the leading branch of global therapeutics, it made climate science too big to fail. And in becoming a tool of political advocacy, the nature of climate science became antithetical to science itself. What is called objectivity consists solely in the critical approach, Popper wrote. Because criticism risked undermining the consensus needed to save the planet, evidence was withheld and criticism delegitimized as serving the interests of malign fossil fuel corporations. In The New Atlantis, Francis Bacon, a former uh, Lord Chancellor of England, argued in the 1620s that the Republic should be governed by scientists. A generation after Bacon, John Locke's political philosophy is based on the Socratic instinct, I insight that to err is human, one that is applicable to science and politics alike. The Constitution of the United States is the fullest and the most perfect embodiment of Locke's political philosophy, popular sovereignty mediated by a constitutional order of checks and balances. It was during the age of global warming that the West came closest to realising Bacon's vision. There was, however, one country that held firm. It is no accident that for many years the United States was the only country to have had a political debate on the science of global warming and that the US was alone in conducting a serious economic analysis of global warming before each major climate treaty. America's political culture, ultimately the American Constitution, ensured debate, discussion and dissension. This is what makes the United States exceptional in the history of global warming. Long may it continue. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rupert. We can open it up for questions now. Um, so if you have any, um, feel free to, to ask them. Uh, just wait for the microphone when you get them so the people watching online can hear. And Rupert, if you want to come back up here, and sure. you can take them on. I think we've got a microphone. Maybe not. Or you could just ask a question from without a microphone. Sorry, anybody? I want to know about your time with David Cameron when you were in the Exchequer. <laughs> we could have a little word about that afterwards if you like. <laughs> you want to return <laughs> Well, he came to New York yesterday to tell the world about global warming. Should we leave it at that for a minute? <laughs> and we do have a microphone now, if anybody has any questions. Hi, um, I'm Jack Spencer here with Heritage. You mentioned something there towards the end of the talk where you uh, associated, or you, you called the global warming agenda too big to fail. I thought that was interesting. Um, mm. As we see, the difficulty in this country in getting beyond too big to fail in financial institutions, yes. um, despite all of the good evidence that that should be the case. I wonder what your thoughts are on moving beyond that mentality on global warming, because we see now really the consensus crumbling all around it, yet the president is out yet just yesterday saying it's the biggest issue facing us. So when do we get beyond the, this too big to fail notion on that? Is it, do we have an opportunity that when this administration's over, maybe we can get beyond it a little bit? Well, the test, in a way, the ultimate test is whether, is whether a country withdraws from the 1992 Climate Change Convention, where, which really sets out the, um, the science, in a way, is there in, in the convention. It's a predicate of the, the convention. Uh, and that parties are enjoined to act to, and Harlan can correct me on this, to avoid uh, d dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate. And 
it was then um, at the Geneva, uh, Geneva COP2, where ministers decided that indeed dangerous anthropogenic interference was going to happen. But so I think there's, I think it, if you like, that is the absolute test where, where, when nations start pulling out of that. But I think in the nature of things, those sort of things, it doesn't really happen like that because I think we're now in a stage where Western nations need this thing to continue to justify extremely costly and destructive energy policies. And to let all that go would imply that their energy policies are... Are wrong and mistaken, and I think that I think that is I think the whole I think the thing is really kept kept going uh, for that reason. Um, I think that's why the Europeans in um, at the Durban uh, COP in uh, 2012, uh, virtually everyone else wasn't going to go into into a Kyoto second second commitment pe period, and the Europeans said, look, if we don't have a, a roadmap to a, a fully comprehensive treaty, Kyoto dies. And, and really, the Europeans were saying that because they just were desperate to keep the thing alive. Because take that away, it makes no sense of their energy policy. So I think the whole issue, it, the issue comes back to these, what, are, what in my view, are completely, completely crazy energy policies. And I should say, by costing costing far more than the banking crisis ever did. I mean, the the, the estimates of uh, the German Germany, the the German environment, the last one, Peter Altmaier, reckoned that uh, the decarbonisation was costing them one trillion euros. It's a great lot, of, great sum of money. Yes, sir, Robert Harvin Watson. Uh, could you comment on the uh, the new commission that's coming on board? They've done some reshuffling. Merging energy and climate, I believe, and, and one of the commissions. And of course, we're going to lose our, uh, I think our climate actions are, uh, Ms. Hildegard. Uh, do you see the, the new commission that is going to be coming in as perhaps uh, bringing more rationality to the debate in Europe? I think there were signs earlier that there was more rationality on the energy side because the commission produced a paper on energy and, and renewables. Uh, earlier this year, and it was more pragmatic. And, and if they were able to exe execute, I wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal on this, and I said, the problem is the, the, the commission has defined, has spotted there's a big problem, but it can't execute a U-turn. And two days later, there was a very interesting letter from a former commission official. I can't remember his name. He was a Dane. And going in, a ver it was, I'm sure it came straight out of the commission saying, we realise there are big problems, the Germans and the Spanish are worried about it. So I think there is, I think there is realisation that they've been heading towards the cliff edge on this and they, they want to change direction. But to the, combining the energy portfolio with the climate change portfolio, I, on the basis of what's happened in the UK, where we have a Department of Energy and Climate Change, that amalgamating the two has been disastrous because it means that you, you basically let the environmentalists run your energy policy. And that is disastrous. So I, I think this commission is more pragmatic than the, than, than the previous one and will be, be inclined to be pragmatic on energy. But in terms of combining those portfolios, I would say the jury's out. We just don't know how it will pan out. Nick Barber, uh, do you have any sense that the changes in technology, Site 3, um, fracking giving more natural gas, it might displace mm. coal, uh, solar cells and the really dramatic drop in the, in the cost of solar cells, and third, the Internet of Things, which give an opportunity to give better control of all sorts of devices and improve efficiency. Do you see that as a as a way potentially of uh, co-opting some of the issues and actually having a a rational technology based solution that doesn't cost a fortune and that may be able to circumvent some of the more irrational approaches that are being pushed? I think that of the three things uh, you mentioned. Uh, fracking is the game changer. Uh, 
for many reasons, and I mean, it is the reason why it is the reason, fundamental reason why ca carbon dioxide emissions in the U U.S. have been falling. Falling on uh, solar and intermittent renewables. Uh, I was sent a. Uh, I just wrote written a piece on on renewables, and um, uh, a professor sent me. Uh, sent me a note and he said there was some very interesting calculation I think for Spanish uh, for Spanish PV investments and he said that if you made because so many of the costs are uh, beyond the plant level that if you made if PV was free it would raise the internal rate of return on on on, on solar projects from two percent to three percent so it's the costs Everyone focuses. It's the levelized cost fallacy. Everyone focuses on, uh, on, on the cost of the kit. What they're not looking at is the problems thrown up by intermittency, which means you 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 have to you spend all that money on backup generation when the when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, and you have huge um, grid connection costs. So in the UK, for example, the grid at the moment the grid connecting the conventional power stations is valued at eight billion to connect. All the wind power will cost a further a further eight billion to connect the offshore wind will cost fifteen billion. So you're talking about huge expand cost capital expansion, which are not you don't see the the, the unit costs of PV and and uh, you know even if wind turbines fall, barely changes the economics. Uh, on smart grid, I'm just uh, I'm not expert enough. All but what I do. What seems to be the case, if you talk to the experts, if you've got intermittent, intermittent uh, electricity, you basically have to completely change all to the way you, you consume and store electricity. So it's like this small tail wagging this huge, you know, what's the, you know, what are you trying to get at, sort of thing. In a way, that's my answer. Hi, uh, my name is Hermes. I just wanted to know your. Uh, view or comment about the position that held that it's rather the, the sun is hibernating and therefore we are going through not a global warming but a global cooling. It's uh, 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 They explain it through the law of rhythm, the natural law of rhythm that wants that every once uh, for uh, many thousands of years the sun has to go hibernating and therefore uh, it will produce rather uh, than global warming but a global cooling. I do, what one does read about, um, I mean Bob Carter who's a leading um, skeptical science has, has warned about the prospects of global warming. As a rule, as, as a historian, I try, I, I, I try to avoid um, uh, making predictions but noting that uh, that there has been there have been changes in, in in the climate in the past. First point, but in, the even bigger one is that this whole area is full of a great deal of uncertainty. Is I think uh, too too soft. Ignorance is I think we just don't know. And my my biggest criticism of the handling of the science has been is is epistemological. It is that the uncertainties. And the lack of understanding and the sheer ignorance are pulled off site, pulled from site. All the the health warnings that should be are removed, and we're kind of we've been told it's settled science and that this will happen. Those two, the, that that is my fundamental disagreement with the with the, with the handling of, of the science. Myron Ebel, Competitive Enterprise Institute. Uh, Rupert, thanks. That was a great talk, and it's a great book, and I encourage everybody to buy a copy. Um, I do, too. <laughs> <laughs> and for those listening, it's The Age of Global Warming, A History by Rupert Darwall, and you can get it on Amazon. Um, I, I wonder, uh, you know, I think you have a rather schematic view of the development of environmentalism, and one of the things that I think is missing that explains a lot about what's happened in the last 30 or 40 years is that, yes, Rachel Carson was uh, important, but she was in a milieu which I think was more important, and that milieu was called the New Left. And when the New Left cracked up, 
the various people in it went into various isms, and perhaps the most successful of those isms in terms of its political effect was environmentalism. And the, the, uh, the gospel of the new left was that uh, we can't trust the workers to overturn capitalism uh, because they, they have been fed, as, as various people said. Well, unfortunately, the proletariat is now well fed and they, they, they have material success and therefore they're no longer interested in overturning this unjust society, so it's up to us intellectuals to do it. And so you have people in the United States like Herbert Marcuse, who became a great guru of, of the new left, but he also, in, later in his life, moved into environmentalism and became a sort of hero of environmentalism. And, you know, there are two things about that. One is uh, that the experts really should be in charge, and scientists are among that class. And the other is that the means are justified by the ends, and that which is a principal tenet of Marxism. And so if you look at the global warming movement, you will see that they will, you know, they don't really care whether the, the means are legitimate because they know they're pursuing a, a, a great end. Uh, and I think, uh, and, and also that we should put them in charge because they're the experts. So I think that's part of the story we need to keep in mind. Yeah, I am, um, I was very grateful when you put, you put me on the tail of Marcuse and, and I've got a section in the book on, on Marcuse and it was very interesting because that he would argue this was the time in the 1960s with the anti-war protesters, and Marcuse was saying the ecocide is a genocide, and sort of linking linking the Vietnam War with uh, environmentalism. But what's also interesting is that whereas the anti-war protesters were a minority of students and a you know minority of the general population, the environmental and the the Earth Day. Um, demonstrations mobilized a lot of Nixon's silent majority, which is which is why he he could face down the anti-war protesters, but he co-opted the environmentalists and created the EPA and and did all those things that you've been campaigning against ever since. So I think there's um, I, I knew, I knew what it did, what environmentalism did was it, it united the soft left and the hard left and they had a they had a program and uh, They've gone a, lo a long way in, in realizing it. Yeah. Well, if we don't have any more questions, please join me in, in thanking Rupert for his talk.